Well, this morning we are going to be in Matthew 26, and it just reminds me of the question. We'll start with the question. When you think of the word legacy, give me a synonym. Give me another word for legacy. Phoebe? Um, I'd say it's like a remembrance. Remembrance. Katie? Um, memorial. Memorial, all right. I would say reputation. Reputation. Okay. Second question, who would be your biblical role models? Biblical role models. What do you got there, Ryan? One of my biblical role models is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. All right. Ruth. Ruth. Okay. Esther. Esther. All right. Mary. Mary. Yeah. Okay. Mary. Now, here's the deal. Which Mary, right? Mary. Ma well, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. There's a whole bunch of them there, <laughs> right? But we are, this morning, we're going to be talking about one of my role models, Mary, the sister of Martha. And Jesus said that what this woman has done for me will be spoken of as a memorial to her. So we hope you'll enjoy today's message titled, Devotion on Display. Go ahead and find a seat, hopefully one that's near you. Maybe one of these mornings we'll play Duck, Duck, Goose or something. We'll just, everybody will change, everybody will change location. Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, Matthew 26. We're going to go through the first 16 verses this morning, and uh, I know that some of you are traveling, got people in from the stock show, and maybe you just woke up late, don't have your Bible with you. We have plenty of Bibles that uh, we want to put in your hands. So does anybody need a Bible to follow along in the first, right over here, in the first 16 verses this morning? Anybody else? Right there, man. Okay, anybody else? Very good. Very good. All right. So, uh, as I often do, let's, let's start this morning with a question. How many of you are embracing the fact that you're getting older? Not just accepting it, but embracing it. Okay. <laughs> the people that have put... A few miles on them, huh? It's kind of like, what well, I really don't have any choice, so <laughs> I may as well like it. Nothing's going to change there. Not an easy thing to do. I, uh, last week or so, I was going through some pictures from, gosh, almost 15 years ago, uh, from 2005, and, and during a time when I taught a, uh, a young adult Bible study out at uh, Darcy Decker's house. Any of you know who Darcy is? Just a great godly gal in our city. Um, where I was able to v invest God's word in, uh, in these young people a couple of times a month and in hopes of leaving a lasting legacy in, uh, in their lives. And uh, we called the group Oasis. We called it Oasis because it was just kind of a break in the middle of the week and and it was just an awesome time to gather and study God's Word. And, and this group, good group of young people, and they loved me so much, they threw me a 50th birthday party. The only problem was that I was just 40. And uh, no, I was actually, I was actually, I was actually 50. And, and uh, these, these little ragamuffins, these young movers and shakers, they got me cards. They got me some birthday cards. And one of them said... Uh, Getting old makes me sad until I remember how old you are. <laughs> that just doesn't, that, it's not very encouraging. Um, and then uh, another one of the cards said, uh, in this time of sorrow, <laughs> in, this, in this time of sorrow. And uh, then another one said, death is closer than you think. <laughs> Happy birthday, right? And then the last one they gave me was, uh, the good news is, next year, you'll be a year older, if you make it, right? If you make it. So uh, they also gave me some gifts. They also gave me some gifts. And one of them was they, uh, they made a little poster up there with, with 50 pennies on it, probably to remind me of, uh, of one of the guys that I went to high school with. That would be Abraham Lincoln, right, <laughs> on there. Uh, they gave me another one. They gave me another one with these... Uh, 
with these rocks. And they told me, they told me, Greg, we gave you 50 rocks because you rock. But, but I know them. I suspect they believe these rocks and I are, are close to the same age. So that's why they gave me the rocks. And then they gave me, they gave me 50 Tootsie Pops. 50 Tootsie Pops, probably because some might think that I'm a little hard on the outside, but I'm just a big softy, you know, on the, on the inside. Yeah, I see you're laughing. I know, I know. And then, uh, and then they gave me this, 50 plastic, 50 plastic dinosaurs. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me, right? 50 plastic dinosaurs, which uh, they tried to convince me. No, it's a compliment. They didn't explain that. They go, Greg, it's a compliment. I go, I don't think so. <laughs> Because I, I reminded them that, that these dinosaurs, they're not just old, they're extinct. <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't doing a, a great job of leaving the legacy on these young people that I had, uh, I had hoped for. But that leads us to this question we should all ask ourselves on a regular basis, on a regular basis, what is your legacy? Right now, Today, what is your legacy? Because here's the deal. What we did yesterday defines our legacy, our reputation today. What did you do yesterday that says, man, that is a man or a woman that I want to follow because that person follows Christ? What is your legacy right now? Whether we think about it or not, you've been building it. You've been building it every day of your life, especially since, uh, since you became a Christian. And it's important. I think it's important. I don't get hung up on what people think about me because I don't really care. No offense. Don't get mad at me. I care what Jesus thinks, right? Uh, but I do. I mean, in, it, there's wisdom. The Bible talks about having a good reputation. So I want to have, have a good reputation here on earth, but... More importantly than that, I want to have a good reputation in heaven. Because right now, guess what? We all have not only a reputation on earth, but we have a reputation in heaven. What is heaven saying about me today? Do you ever think about that kind of stuff? What is heaven saying about us today? Uh, Lisa, I don't know if she's here or not today, but Lisa, uh, a couple of weeks ago, allowed me to preside over her sister's memorial. And it, it always causes me to think, if people were completely honest, which most people aren't at funerals, right? If people were completely honest, what would they say? What would they say at my funeral? What would my legacy, what would my legacy be? How many people would come? How many people would take time off from work? At, P, at, uh, at my funeral, would people be listening to the pastor or would they be looking at their watch? Would my life still be impacting people after I was in heaven? Do you ever think about this kind of stuff? I think it's important that we, that we do that. You know, this morning we're going to be introduced to a woman that we should all want to be like. A woman who sat at the feet of Jesus, a woman who was sacrificially devoted to her Savior. And uh, I probably say this every week, but this would be a great week. This would be a great week to take some notes. So just a reminder, here at Calvary Chapel, I always encourage you, bring three things, right? First thing that we bring, bring a Bible, right? Bring a Bible and put notes in it, right? And then uh, maybe bring a journal, something that you can take some extended notes in, and then just bring a pen or a pencil or, or whatever your writing implement of choice would be. And then after church, either uh, Sunday afternoon uh, or Monday morning, just, just kind of review some of the things that the Holy Spirit spoke to you specifically and let it sink, sink way in. What is your legacy? So in Matthew... In Matthew 25, we looked at two parables. The first of them was what? The parable of the ten virgins, right? The ten virgins reminding us that uh, our bridegroom, who's our bridegroom? Jesus. 
His name's over there on the wall, right? Our bridegroom, Jesus, could be returning for us at any moment. Thus, we should be prepared for his coming by having our lamps trimmed and full of oil in our faithfulness to him. And we're being assured of our heavenly promise and that the door will not be shut like the five virgins who were not ready. There were five that were ready and five that weren't. So the first parable was about being ready for the Lord's return. The second, the second parable was about our faithfulness in stewardship while we are waiting for his return. And our example there was, was three men. They were all given talents, uh, uh, varying amounts of money. The first two were faithful, and they put their master's resources to good use and, and doubled their stewardship of what was given to them. And the, the third chose not to be a faithful steward. What did he do? He went and buried it, right? He went and buried his master's money in a hole and then gave it back to him when his master returned. So for their efforts, the first two, the first two heard their master say this, well done, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into what? The joy of the Lord, right? Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then there was a third man. And as we discussed, this third person, he could care less what he had been asked to do by his master. And what did the master say to him? Do you remember? You wicked and lazy. Sir, so remember there were five words that we'd never want to hear? Yeah, and those five would be in there. You wicked and lazy servant. And then the master went on to say, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, I, uh, I know that it's difficult to be in a church that teaches the importance of a response, a heart response to what Jesus has done for us. But it's the love of Christ that compels me to serve him. It's not following a religious list of do's and don'ts or, or thinking that I'm going to get an attaboy for doing that. He owns me. He's my master. If he asks me to do something, it's not like, it's not like I, I have an option to say no. It, just, it, it makes no sense to me that people who claim that Jesus is their Lord and Savior would say no to him. So I know, I know it's hard, but I'm encouraging you, just get past that hard part because it gets easier once you realize that whatever he says, I'm going to do. Instead of always arguing, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do this. And you give partial obedience. And, uh, and it, just doesn't, it just doesn't work out well in the long run. As you can imagine, my encouragement is just to be faithful to the Lord. Just be faithful and do it not because some pastor encourages you to, but because you love Jesus more than anything. More than anything. And you want to be a good steward of what he has given us and... And we don't do it to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but you will. He promises that you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, if you have been faithful. Now, chapter 24 and 25 in the Gospel of Matthew takes place just a couple of days. I mean, we are, we are winding down Jesus' earthly ministry just a couple of days before the crucifixion. And both chapters dealt with the questions the disciples had asked him concerning his return. In chapter 26, how many of you have read ahead? Chapter 26, just read it, I just want to know, okay? Not like I'm going to remember by the time this study is over, I'm just curious. Chapter 26 is 75 verses long. So about this time tomorrow, we should be, uh, we should be done. No, we're... Uh, we're not going to go through all of it this morning. It's probably going to take at least three weeks to break it down. But I want you to write down the themes of this chapter, okay? The themes of this chapter, 
Number one that I put is devotion. Devotion. And then we're going to have the theme of betrayal. We're going to have a theme of sacrifice. We're going to have a theme of submission. And then we're going to have a theme of persecution. I like the first one. <laughs> I don't like betrayal and sacrifice and submission and persecution. But let's pray. We'll pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started in verse 1 of chapter 26. God, uh, where would we be without your word to be able to guide us and to reveal your heart and your love and your mercy and your grace and your, your kindness and your compassion uh, for us? And along with that, God, you have, you have given us examples in your word, real people some who loved you and some who pretended to love you. And today, God, you're going to teach us about two of those people. And I pray, God, that our hearts and our minds would be set on things above and not things below. Speak to us, Lord. Your people want to hear your voice today. All right. Verse 1, Matthew <laughs> I hadn't even turned there. Matthew chapter 12. Are you guys all there? Yeah. Um, bunch of teacher's pets. Okay. How does that go? Matthew, Mark, Luke. There it is, Matthew 26. Verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings. What sayings? Remember, there's no... There's no page breaks, and there were no chapters. This is a continuation of chapter 24 and chapter 25, where Jesus had just done what? Given the Olivet Discourse. Why do we call it the Olivet Discourse? Because it was given on the Mount of Olives. Olives. There you go. There you go. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he said to his disciples, hey, guys, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. What if you were there and you physically heard Jesus say that? What would go on in your heart at that very moment? What would happen in your heart? This is the third time. This is the third time that Jesus has plainly prophesied uh, his soon coming death at the hands of these uh, religious leaders. And in Matthew 16, 21, so that would be good to write in your Bible right now, right next to that, Matthew 16, 21, and Matthew 17, 23. And we read uh, that Jesus added he would be raised from the dead on the third day in those previous verses. And in Matthew 17, Jesus told them that he was going to be betrayed into the hands of the men who would kill him. And in that particular text, it said that the disciples were full of grief at this news. And, and what I find interesting here, that Jesus has just told them that he is going to die in just two days, right before the Passover, and Matthew records no response of the disciples. No response of the disciples. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called, what's his name? Caiaphas, right? And plotted to take Jesus by trickery and throw him a birthday party? No. They, what are they going to do? And kill him. Verse 5. But they said, not during a feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. This is pure evil, this plotting. This is pure evil committed by these religious leaders of the people. The ones who were called to proclaim the Messiah is coming chose instead to murder the Messiah. Every time they attempted to trap Jesus, embarrass him, or prove him wrong, in a matter of just a few words, Jesus exposed their phony baloney trap, and he quoted Scripture. To them to prove them wrong. 
So they have concluded that they can't win a fair fight and have decided to resort to, to trickery. Now, uh, write the word dolos, D-O-L-O-S. It's a Greek word, dolos. And it means guile or craftiness. So their trickery here, that's what, the, that's what they're doing, guile and craftiness. Who does that sound like to you? Starts with an S. Satan, yeah, very good. Starts with an S, right? A little hissing S. They are the perfect example of when people can't defend their position. Well, let me say, when they can't defend their position biblically, they turn to ugly and desperate measures. And these supposedly godly men want to eliminate the questions that are coming at them by eliminating the questioner. You ever had somebody get mad at you because you spoke the truth in love to them? I think it's, is it, is it Galatians? It's one of the epistles where, where uh, he says, where Paul says, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And unfortunately, that's what happens. I mean, you've lost friends because you love them enough to speak truth into their life and they don't want to hear the questions that you ask for them. So they want to eliminate the questioner. These religious leaders had been looking for a way to kill Jesus since the inception of his ministry. I mean, it goes all the way back. It goes all the way back to Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Let's read this together. What's it say? Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians that they might kill Jesus. Now, why hadn't they followed through on their desire? And the scriptures had told us because they feared. They feared the people. Why did they fear the people? Because for the most part, the people loved Jesus. They loved Jesus. They understood his offer of grace and love and forgiveness. And the Apostle Peter, uh, through the pen of Mark, tells us this in Mark chapter 12, verse 37. It says, and the common people, what's it say? Uh, Heard him gladly, gladly. You know, the message of the gospel is good news to the common people. It's religious people that Jesus always had a problem with. And we run into religious people all the time who think that they know it all. And it's, uh, it's just dangerous. I was telling some friends last night, I just, I live by the principle that I don't know what I don't know. So it makes me hungry. I, I, I always want to learn. Primarily, I want to learn how to become a better follower of my king. But I... I love information. I love knowledge because it gives me something to draw on when I'm trying to share the gospel with people. It's just a good thing to do. So, so stay hungry. Don't let your minds go dormant, right? Now, um, the scene switches a little bit, and the day switches well because, because, and we know this, because John's gospel, John's gospel tells us that this incident actually happened when? Six days before the Passover. So we know that it's a little flashback here. And this isn't an inconsistency because Matthew and Mark, are, they're, they're less interested in the exact chronology and they're more interested in a comparison. And the comparison that we're going to see, we're going to see the comparison of Mary, a godly woman, as opposed to Judas, an ungodly, an ungodly man. Look at verse 6. And when Jesus was in what city? Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. Bethany was, uh, you know, it was a town. It's just, just east of the Mount of Olives, only a couple of miles from the holy city of Jerusalem. And uh, on the last Israel trip, we always take people up to the overview there where, where if, you look, if you look west, you're looking straight at, uh, at Temple Mount. Um, and uh, it, it was there, it was there that some people actually had an opportunity. Uh, you recognize those faces? It's fun to ride a camel. It's not like you want to ride one every day to work, but hey, at least it gave you, gave you a photo op right there. But uh, you get to, to ride a camel, and, and Bethany is just on the east side of the Mount of Olives. On our day off, on the day off that we had, I rented a car. And uh, Aaron was kind enough to drive with me. And we went all around that whole area, all the areas that's usually off limits to, uh, to tourists. We just went over on the other side, which is, 
uh, today primarily a, uh, uh, a Muslim community. So Jesus, along with the disciples, is a, uh, a guest of a man named Simon the what? Simon the leper. Simon the leper. How'd you like to have that as your name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simon the leper. Most will conclude, conclude that uh, this was a man Jesus had healed of leprosy and, and out of gratitude opened his home for a large uh, banquet is what it looks like here. And we get a better understanding if we call this man the man formerly known as a leper. I think that's where Prince got the idea. Remember Prince? Uh, artist formerly known as Prince? Yes. Young people, ask your parents. You'll get it. Look at verse 7. This is so beautiful. Underline this. And a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil. And what does she do with it? She poured it on him and poured it on his head as he sat at the table. I want to paint a picture here. I want to paint a picture here in your minds as to uh, what this might have looked like. Now, according to the culture of that day, they would have been reclining on pillows or, or, or kneeling with their feet behind them at a, at a low table, maybe about the height of this podium right here, okay? Not a, not, a, not a tall table like we would think about today. So when you see, when you see the, uh, the Renaissance picture, right, of Jesus and the boys seated at a table and chairs like we do today, that is most likely not accurate. In walks a woman. The other gospels define her as who? Mary. As Mary, the sister of, uh, of Martha and Lazarus. And what is she carrying? She is carrying a very expensive spice called spikenard. And that's what I have right here. Let's see. Okay, take that. If you're uh, Joe. If you're, uh, let's see, good catch, good catch. Just open it up. If you, have, uh, if you have an allergy or something to perfume, don't whiff it, okay? But I want you, you know, what I wanted, well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to set a fan up here and just kind of pour some of the little things so it would fill this whole sanctuary. But then I thought about it, I go, there's going to be at least one person there that has an allergy, and then I'm going to hear about it, and... So anyway, just take a whiff of this and just pass it on so that you, uh, that you have it. And give those back to me. Okay, you little spike nerd thieves. Don't anybody make off with those. Okay, so I'll be able to use them again. In enters Mary. And she takes this extremely costly spice and she breaks the neck off of it. It would have been a, would have been a, a, a tall flask, probably with a longer neck. And she breaks off the narrow neck of the bottle and gently pours it on the head of Jesus. And in John's gospel, he mentions that she also pours it where? On his, yeah, on his, on his feet, on his feet. And this extravagant example of devotion makes Mary one of the original Spice Girls. (laughs) Okay, that's what I'm thinking. So let's, uh, so let's call her Servant Spice. Okay, servant spice, or, or spirit-filled spice, or savior-loving spice. You decide. Gets the point across. As we're going to find out, this was an extremely expensive gesture. Mark's gospel tells us that this one bottle, this one bottle of perfume was worth a year's wages, 300 denarii. What do you think the average what do you think the average salary is in Rapid City? What do you think the average salary is? 41k is what uh, what I found out. So in today's terms, this woman in one incident gave the equivalent of 41k to express her love and thankfulness for his love for her. Isn't that amazing? That just boggles my mind. Now, I'm not sure that God is calling us all to show our love and thankfulness in giving a full year's salary. But if he is, good for you, man. Probably not. Probably not. 
But here's a question. What is it costing you to give towards the furtherance of God's kingdom? What sacrifice, right? What sacrifice? And what I mean by that, what are you doing without to be faithful in your time? Because service isn't service without sacrifice. David said, hey, I'm not going to give anything that doesn't cost me something. And he had quite a bit of wealth. The Lord was asking me, what are you buying with the money God has entrusted you to give back to him? Now, that's a question, right? What are you buying with the money that God has entrusted you to give back to him for the furtherance of his kingdom? First Chronicles, turn your Bibles, First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12 through 14. It says, both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Verse 13 says, Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you. And of your own we have given to you. You understand what's going on there? I think about this. All the time. It's just never been a challenge to me. God. It's just, I've, I've never fought God on this one. But, but giving, giving is an act of worship. Whatever you're giving. Giving is an act of worship. And what David is communicating is that, is that if God owns everything, that means that I own what? Nothing. nothing. I own Nothing. <laughs> What that tells me is that what I possess, God owns. And he has given me the privilege of stewardship. And a portion of those resources should be set aside for the things that are close to his heart. If God owns everything, it means that man owns nothing. I own nothing in the big picture. You own nothing. It all belongs to God. What I possess God owns. Now, this, this really helps me. God doesn't tax his people. God doesn't tax his people. He tests his people to see if we will recognize that everything we have has come from his divine bounty, not our human efforts. So it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of what? It's right here, man. It's an issue of the heart. It's an act of worship and gratefulness for his provision in our lives. And, and this woman, Mary, uh, I don't picture her as a wealthy person. You know, Mary gave from her heart. And that's all God expects from those who call him Lord. Now, when you've read through this, most of you have read through this before, have you ever asked the question, well, where did Mary get the moolah, right? Where did she get this huge amount of money? Something of such great value. And the speculation is maybe some of it was left over from Lazarus's burial. Could be. It's not my first choice. I think my first choice is that, uh, that it was part of her dowry and it would, be, would have been saved for use on her wedding night. Are you thinking about that right now? Are you thinking about what that really means? I, I'm sure like every other single woman, she dreamt of her wedding night in a marriage. Yet she regarded her relationship with the Lord so high above anything else that she knew she owed Jesus everything. And this sacrifice was no sacrifice compared to the sacrifice he was going to make for her. Like I said, there's a lot we can learn from this woman. We're going to find out that she had actually been listening to what Jesus had been teaching about his soon death and resurrection because Jesus is going to tell the group that Mary did this anointing in preparation for what? His yep, his burial. His burial. Something that you understand 
It didn't happen beforehand, right? Because they take him off the cross and they put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb before he can be anointed. That's why they come the first uh, day of the week to be able to anoint him there. I, I, the original title for this message was Empty Bottle Full Heart. It's out there on the, on, the, uh, on the sign. But as I was going through this, I changed the title to Devotion on Display. Devotion on Display. Who do you know? I hope you have people in your life like this. Who do you know that have devotion like Mary and that their devotion has challenged you to up your game in devotion to him? It's just like, uh, just like playing tennis. You know, you want to play with somebody who is better than you so that you can improve or golf or mountain biking or anything. You want to go out and you... It's, it's a, who do you have in your life that is maybe slightly, maybe way above where you are spiritually, but you want to grow into that. And some, somebody that you're not just reading about in the Scripture, somebody that you're seeing tangibly. I just... I love this woman because it challenges me to ask myself the question, am I willing to be misjudged by others for my relentless public adoration of the Lord? How many of you have ever been uh, tempted to show less zeal for the Lord when you're around other people, right? Can we all just say yes? We've all done that, right? But at home, you're dancing in your chonies, you know, to uh, uh, don't get that visual, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you're just dancing around your house as unto the Lord as though you're dancing for an audience of one. But that's what we should do all the time. It, it, it breaks my heart to see people stifle their devotion for others because they're concerned about the person sitting next to them. What are they going to think? What are they going to think? Well, <laughs> I hope you understand that it's okay to be misjudged by others because we're going to get an example of that right here. Find out uh, the response of the other disciples to this beautiful act of worship. Verse 8 says, uh, And all the disciples arose, smiled, and lovingly gave her a standing ovation. Right? That's not what it says. That's not what, look at verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. And what did they say? Why this waste? Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for uh, much and given to the poor. You know, in the parallel passage of John 12, we're told that the ringleader for this wave of outrage is who? None other than Judas. And his concern was not for the poor. It was for himself because he was in charge of what? The money box. And he wanted to spend other people's money on himself. Sounds like our politicians today, huh? Doesn't it? So... The disciples call this example of extravagant love a waste. A waste. Jesus calls this kind of extravagant love worship. Worship. It boggles my mind that some people see, see a Christian's high-octane devotion as a waste of time and a waste of money. Yet the same people waste money on needless, needless things. Case in point, case in point, just two weeks back, a new toilet went on sale. You probably have this, okay? Maybe some of you have ordered this, right? New toilet went on, on sale uh, with a starting price of a meager $7,000, right? Seven now, before you start bagging on it, know that it comes with built-in surround sound speakers. That is not the room that I go to to listen to my 80s mixtape, okay? Okay? What would be on the playlist of that? She came in through the bathroom window. Poops, I did it again. It's my potty and I'll cry if I want to. Right? No, it just... <laughs> That's not all. 
It has ambient mood lighting, a heated seat. Now, come on. Not bad, right? Okay. A, heated, a heated seat, warm water cleansing with a dryer, and automatic lid opening and closing and flushing. I can tell you this, that the, uh, the, the, the seat, you know, went automatically down. It would remove, it would remove some marital arguments. I can tell you that much right there. Amen. One of the models uh, even has an option for what they call tornado flush. <laughs> have you ever, I know, have you ever seen a tornado? I don't think I need something. I don't think I need that feature on my toilet. It's activated. It's activated uh, through voice recognition through, uh, guess who? Alexa, yeah, through your Amazon Alexa, providing the ability to check the weather and listen to the news and order new toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, all while sitting on a pot. Just what the world needs, a talking toilet, a communicating commode, right? Look at the person next to you and say, what a waste of money. What a waste of money. How ironic a toilet to throw your money down the toilet. The uber expensive device here, this one, it seems like something you would see on a Game of Thrones. Oh. Go ahead, you can boo on that. I know. I, I, I didn't, it wasn't serious. You didn't really have to, right? Explain it to somebody if they didn't get that Game of Thrones. Get it? How many of you enjoy the Go just by a show? Don't raise your hands. Okay. But it, I enjoy the Go as much as the next guy. But come on, do we really need toilet technology? I mean, if I was gonna, if I was gonna have to rate this, I'd rate it a number one or a number two. So, um, <laughs> our, come on back. Our culture, right? Our culture wastes money on such foolish things, doesn't it? Such foolish things. And yet they call us crazy for acts of giving to our missionaries or supporting pregnancy centers or getting Bibles to people who don't have them or training up indigenous people to win their people to Christ, to provide a building for corporate worship and the proclamation of God's word, training our children just 100 feet away over in their classrooms, training them in the admonition and love for the Lord. It gives us, it provides us an, an, an opportunity to fellowship with one another and even, and even what they do, they call it a waste. And they look at this experience of Mary. Why this waste? Why this, why this waste? Now, on uh, this <coughs> indignant response from all these disciples, Mark's gospel tells us that these bonehead disciples said, said that they didn't just say, why this waste? It says that they sharply <coughs> criticized her. They sharply criticized her. And, and notice how quickly they pile on Mary for being a Jesus fanatic. For being a Jesus fanatic. Mary's going a little over the top. We need to shut this down before things get out of hand or other, other people might do what? Go over the top for Jesus too. Remember that these disciples were claiming to be on the same team as Mary. I think it breaks the heart of God when he sees believer on believer attack. Friendly fire. One person, one person, <coughs> Judas, not even a believer, lifts off. And look how rapidly other men were to follow his bad example. The devil is very, very good at getting baby Believers, And you can, be, you can be 70 years old. You can be 80 years old, professing to walk with the Lord for 25, 30, 40 years, and still be a baby believer because your, your attitude represents whether you're taking this for real or not. I, you know, I've known people that have known the Lord for a year, and they're, they're living it out. Hard. They're making the changes that God has made. They're not gossiping. They're not complaining. They're not slandering. But look how often that happens. Friendly fire. Believer on believer 
attack. And the devil is very good at getting baby believers to fall for his schemes and do his dirty work. I was once told the worst thing that a Christian can do can do the devil's work in the Christian uniform. It's just sad that it just shouldn't be like that. But we have examples of it, and we see it today. Like we mentioned last week, why not? Why not let 2019 be the year we finally make the choice to not let other people's flesh-led drama entice us into a fight God hasn't called us to? Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? That just is exhausting. Let 2019 be the year that we finally focus on our own house. Those of you that were here on Wednesday night, you heard me say that, why don't we just learn to mind our own what? Beeswax, Beeswax, right? Mind our own beeswax. And when someone grumbles saying, why this waste or why this or why that, why don't we simply speak the truth in love and say, why don't you stop thinking about yourself, give this to the Lord and move on? If you did that, if I did that, you would excel in spiritual maturity. So the disciples have thrown a little hissy fit over Mary anointing the Lord. Let's see how Jesus responds to their ridicule and criticizing her what? Sharply. Criticized her sharply. Look at verse 10. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. In the New Living Translation, Jesus says, why are you criticizing this woman? You ever heard the Holy Spirit say that to you? Why are you criticizing this woman? Why are you criticizing this man? Why are you criticizing her? And personally, when he said this, I don't think Jesus was using his indoor voice. I think he... Uh, I think there was some gusto behind it. So understand this. You might even want to write this down. The disciples condemn her, but Jesus commends her. The disciples condemn her, and Jesus commends her. I love this. Jesus to the rescue. How many times has Jesus rescued you? Countless, right? Jesus, Jesus to the rescue. I think letter alone in Greek would be better translated... Back off, Jack, she's mine, right? Back off. Reminds me of what the Lord says in, uh, in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3. What's that say? I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. Aren't you thankful that, that, God, that God is our defense? Aren't you thankful that God is our defense? And he says to the enemy, Back off, she's mine, or back off, he's mine. Who are the Chihuahua lovers here? Raise your hands. I know, I know, there you go. They're bug-eyed rat dog, but I know that some of you have them, and I've tried to talk you out of it, but apparently, you know, you just squeeze them harder, and they're, you know, eyes pop out a little bit further. So, you're probably familiar with this story, uh, Bulldog, a, uh, a Doberman, and a, uh, a Chihuahua. They're hanging at the, out at the park, and a, and a beautiful Border Collie walks past them, and they all yell out, hey, I want to be your boyfriend. Yes, this is a talking dog story. Just going to roll with it, okay? So the Collie says, uh, well, I need a smart. I need a smart boyfriend. So the Doberman says, uh, I'm, I'm smart. And she says, okay, well, this is how we're going to define it. I need uh, I will be the girlfriend of the one who can use the word liver and cheese in the same sentence, okay? Liver and cheese in the same sentence. So, so, the, so the, 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 first, uh, the first guy, the first uh, bulldog says, uh, I love liver and cheese. And the collie replies, that's not good enough for me. And the, the uh, uh, other one grumbles out, you know, and... and uh, in kind of a German accent, the, uh, the other one, a Doberman, says, uh, says, I hate liver and cheese. And she says, well, that's not creative at all. She looks at the Chihuahua who smiles and says in a Mexican accent, liver alone, cheese mine. 
You get it? Leave her alone. She's, she's mine. I'm thankful that God is my protector. <laughs> Keep groaning. It's all right. Do you ever think about this? Jesus is my defense attorney. He's your defense attorney. He says, the enemy accuses you night and day before the Lord. He said, well, yeah, those things are true about Greg, but he's committed his heart to me. Case closed. And he doesn't stop with liver alone, she's mine. He continues, look at verse 11. For you have the poor with you always, but you do not always have me. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. This means that she had been paying more attention than the disciples had, right? The disciples don't get it, but <laughs> the hotshot disciples, you know, the apostles, right? More like B or C or D apostles as if you know their attitudes here. Look at verse 13. This is, this is the crux of this story. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial, as a memorial to her. You know, when you're sharing the gospel, you can include some real-life examples of people who believe the gospel. And this, this, this act of Mary, who we don't even know her last name, her story has lived on for 2,000 years and is an example to all of us that Jesus took notice of her oil, but he took even greater notice of her heart, a heart that loved her Savior. And next we get the polar opposite. Check this out. This is definitely uh, the opposite of an appreciating heart. Look at verse 14. Then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. And said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him, what? 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Judas sells out his friend for 30 pieces of silver. And according to Exodus 21, 32, that is the same price that someone would pay the owner of a slave who had been killed. I'm sure that priests... Uh, these priests, would, they, they, they would have paid more. But in God's economy, this amount was simply fulfilling what Zechariah 11.12 said, that the Messiah would be betrayed for this exact sum, 30 pieces of silver. How could Judas do such a thing? After all, he'd been around Jesus for the past three years. He'd seen the miracles. He'd been given power to perform miracles. He had seen Jesus model unconditional love to him and the others. Time and time again. How could he do it? How could he do it? The same way that people do it today. They simply take God's love for granted. Now, as we, as we wrap things up and we prepare our hearts for, uh, for communion this morning, I want you to look back. Look back there at verse 13, where Jesus said that this woman's act of worship should be preached in conjunction with the gospel, just like we're doing. You see, this is fulfilled prophecy. We're doing exactly what Jesus said would happen. We're preaching the gospel, and we're using this woman as our example today. What a precious legacy Mary leaves. And yet here we're reminded that every person, all of us are leaving a legacy. All of us are, are leaving a legacy right now of what is valuable in our life. I read recently about a man uh, who said that when he died, he wanted to be buried. He wanted to be buried in his bowling ball. In his bowling ball. So they hollowed it out, right? They, they hollowed out a bowling ball. And there he sits on the mantle. His legacy, he once bowled a 300. Perfect game, which really isn't a big deal. I've done that. Just took me three games to get there. But uh, <laughs> I don't want to be remembered as the guy who rode a mountain bike or the guy who played baseball or, or uh, the guy who had exquisite taste in attire. <laughs> or a humble, or, or as a humble guy. How about that? Yeah. I want to be remembered as a man that inspired others to hold nothing back 
in their internal and their external devotion and adoration of Jesus, not caring for a millisecond about how the rest of the world might criticize me sharply or say, why this waste? Knowing that those who are sold out on earth already have a legacy and a reputation in heaven, and that reputation will last for eternity. So, again, this is a new year. We're four weeks in. I'm encouraging you to commit to making 2019 the year where everyone can see full display of devotion for our Lord and Savior, right? Hold nothing back. Devotion on display. Father, thank you for just a great group of believers who are dedicated to you and dedicated to your word and simply want to continue to build our legacy on earth and more importantly in heaven. And so today, God, I pray that you would empower us with the Holy Ghost, that we would stop thinking that we can do this thing called life on our own without yielding to you, making that our goal, to yield to you and to trust that you will, uh, will see us through, see us through the trial. And God, would you help us to be good ambassadors? Be like this woman, Mary, who when Martha was buzzing all over the place, Jesus told Martha that Mary has desired a better thing. And this one thing is needed because sitting at your feet will help us to sit at the feet of others and to serve them and to be proponents of the good news and just wanting everyone to know that they too have an opportunity to have a best friend in Jesus. Use us, Lord. Use us. We beg you. We beseech you. We plead with you. Use us to be the light of the world and that all men would be drawn unto you if you are lifted up. Amen. Okay, so we just got done with our study in Matthew 26, and uh, what are some things that we can apply to our life uh, out of this particular study? Phoebe? Um, I liked Mary's resilience and how she continued to show her devotion to God, even though people were getting mad at her. That's right. She didn't care. She lived for an audience of one. That's good, okay? Katie? I like the fact that Mary gave it all to Jesus, and it's like, for us, we should be giving him our all because what we have is because of what he's given to us. Amen, sister. All right. Absolutely. All right. Uh, how about that sound I almost bite? said amen, sister. That would be wrong. Keep Brother, going. Yeah. How about that sound bite <laughs> of uh, Jesus isn't here to tax, but he is here to test on our stewardship of the things he's given us. Yeah, he doesn't tax us. He tests us on our stewardship for everything. So that's good. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. So, and thank you for watching Calvary Chapel Rapid City. And if you'd like to be notified, next time we have a video available for you. Phoebe, what do they need to do? Hit the subscribe button. And? Click the little bell. Yep, and click the little bell. We'll see you next time.